Winner bracket final! We are in the new patch, everybody. It dropped just during the tournament, during the first day of the tournament here. But the teams have now gotten a few games under their belt with the patch. They have a bit of an idea of what to think about Nazebo, what to think about the changes to Zagara and others. And now we're heading into another best of five, and it is the winner bracket final between Team Wah and the Hardos. Both of them were able to take their first round match with a 3 0, so pretty dominant performance by the both. And. The interesting part is that these two teams obviously faced off multiple times now in the grand final of the playoff tournaments. Sorry, the uh, qualification tournaments for the playoffs. So, until now, the record definitely shows that the blue team is a bit superior. They've won every single one of these games, I think with one exception, so it was pretty incredible. Now, we have other teams obviously in the tournament that will threaten the dominance of Team WA quite a bit. Donuts, for example, but since they didn't participate in this many qualification tournaments, they find themselves in the lower bracket, so they have to make a bit of a bigger run until they can face off against the blue team. But if the Hardos step it up today, then they have a chance of taking the blue team down. Now, as I've stated in multiple of the previous games, Team War is the one to beat. With how dominant they were in all of the qualification tournaments that they participated in, they are really the team that you have to take down. But we all know that the Hardos are obviously stacked and they are incredibly powerful too. So if they have a good day, they can make that happen. Now we're on Curse Tolo. 4,000 euros in total are on the line here at the X Cup Summer Playoffs. As mentioned before, all of that sponsored by a private Heroes of the Storm fam from Europe, from Germany to be exact, that has been playing and watching Heroes of the Storm ever since Alpha, throughout Beta, all the competitions, the tournaments, HTC even afterwards as well, and wants to now give back and support the esports scene here, which is pretty impressive. So yeah, our Mr. X, is making all of this possible. And yeah, let the games begin. I couldn't agree more, Medivh. So we got a Medivh. They're already stepping it up in game number one. We have Dehaka, Medivh, and Vala locked in very quickly. So with Medivh as a second support, so to say, for Vala, there's a lot of potential to put her into a position where Nick can get incredibly aggressive. Zelia is picking Muradin. His Anubara got banned. So, that's the interesting part about it. By now, teams are starting to just ban out Anubarak against Zelia because they realize that Zelia just likes to play Anubarak. And that he's obviously damn good at it. Now, we got Banana H on Brightwing. We got Zelia on the Dwarf. Stitches gets banned. They don't want to go give them the opportunity to go for a kidnap combo. Kidnap combo, in case that you don't know what that is. You hook, you gorge, and then you escape through Medivh's portal and put a huge amount of distance between you and and the opponent's team to isolate the target and kill it. Sylvanas also taken. Yeah, and with that, we have our next double pick coming in. We need the damage. Tychus is still up, so Tychus could be a potential pick for them. They played, obviously, in the last series. Uh, well, in the last series, we saw the Vikings played once. This time, it's not going to happen for the Hardos. But on the other hand, we could, of course, see it here. Blaze and Falstads. A little bit of global action is coming. Muradin and Blaze for the stuns. Falstad can also help with the Gust. And, by the way, once that you have Wind Tunnel, you have another fantastic tool against the opponent's uh, portals. So it's going to make it much, much harder for Mediv to set that game-deciding portal up and get good use out of it. You want to have portal control, and any kind of CC that you have is helping with this. Now, last two picks. What are we getting as a main tank? It's Bad Benny's Diablo. So they go for the combo, the ley line into the apocalypse, and we get Rega again. We already had a few Rega games, and on this map, you have, of course, a lot of camps where Rega can excel again. And keeping Diablo alive is absolutely pivotal in this particular composition. Dino has the last pick. They need some more damage. Game number one in the best of five series. It is the winner bracket final. And our last pick sets us up with Dino locking in... Greyman. Yep, the doggies on each side. Rega against Greyman. So both of them able to get some damage in against the mercenary camps. Chunked on some structures. And just help out in general. Guys, let's go. Curse Solo, first map in the best of five series between Team Wa and the Hardos. Off we go. Map number one in the best of five. Yet the winner bracket final. On the left side, Azerite on Falstad for Team Wa. We got Dino on Greymane. Dequaz on Blaze. Banana H on Brightwing. And Zelia with Muradin. 
Mirrodin and Anubarak, definitely the two heroes that he plays the most right now. Hazops with Medivh, we're going to keep an eye on his baseline stacks, of course. Nick is playing Vala. Yazu with Rega. We got Copenhagen on Dehaka. And Bad Benny is playing Diablo. Okay, here we go. Now, again, several times when they met in uh, the grand finals of those qualifiers, it was the blue team that won. But now there's always a chance that they bring it back and win the most important match. The one in the playoffs. The one in the winner bracket final, at least for now. Whichever team wins here moves on to the grand final. The best of seven series that's going to be played out on Sunday. And it starts with a kill on Medivh. Now, if you die as Medivh, then die early. Because it means that you don't have a lot of stacks yet. But Hazo, of course, getting dropped here is not a great start for the Hardos. We have for Falstead now, the frequent flyer on level 1. And topside, that's where we have our solo lane set up in just another moment. With this time Azerite taking the lane, so not Blaze. Diablo is already at the bottom of the map here. And Hazops is ready too. The team that wins moves on, as I mentioned, to the grand final, a best of 7 series. And won't have to play on the second day of the tournament at all. When we're focusing on the loser's bracket. Whoever takes... The loss in the series will drop down into the loser's bracket, has another shot to make it to the grand final. So there's that. But at this point, there's of course the big question, which one is locking in a lead in this best of five? We had two pretty decisive series so far in the tournament, as you could have expected. Maybe with the exception of the Flipping Mafia, I gotta admit that I expected a little bit more from them. But the Hardos played it first of all real well. And I think also what played a role is that the patch just dropped really minutes before the series started and that of course also introduced a lot of uncertainty into the match. Either way, a bit of aggression is happening in the mid lane as the teams are going for their mercenary camps and with the blue team setting theirs up a bit faster, they are able to get damage in against the tower and the gate. Brightwing is a level 4, everybody else is also locking it in now, the multi-shot build continues, Haas has a few stacks, nothing crazy, only locked in 2, but we're waiting of course for the next team fight. Once level 10 hits, they have the ley line into the Apocalypse, which is going to be their big wombo combo that they can use especially in choke points. But they are already being aggressive in the mid lane as they are trying to get value out of their own camp, even the Haka is joining the fun. He's not able to do a lot because everybody retreated past the gate right away. But that allows Vala to get a lot of damage out. And the portal is there just a second later to allow them to escape. The shield as well, since Benny is trapped just before he reaches the portal. That's 12 stacks now for Medivh and 17 for Vala. Yeah, at the bottom of the map, that's where the first tribute spawns now. Experience is similar for the teams. We have a single kill, and that's it. And now, of course, the big chance to maybe get a kill too for the Hardos. But keep in mind that they also have now the Haka at the top lane. Falsehood is the one that locks in the Siege Giants for them. And that pressures the top a lot. And the Haka really has to think about whether or not he wants to join the fight down here. Because if he doesn't, uh, then he can still defend against the camp. And they're just letting this one slide. It's not even a question for them. So they weren't really in a great position in the first place and then they just decided, well, we can't really do a lot here. So let's just have them, let them get the first tribute. We're defending the top because if Azerite pushes this in with the Siege Giants that could destroy the entire wall, there's still some aggression at the bottom. The early level 7 allows them, of course, to go for the 2. Secret Weapon comes now in as a level 7 talent. That, of course, by now is a real solid choice. And at the top, we also have that fight continuing. Seems like Copenhagen is a bit under pressure. Needs to get the drag in. Where's the tongue when he need it? Yeah, he's even trying to threaten Azerite a bit, but so far that didn't work out. Level 7, by the way, the frost shot is now in. Okay, and Copenhagen is slowly taking those siege giants apart. And the fight in the middle of the map? Yeah, hyper aggressive, both teams. They're really jarring to poke here as much as they can. Yeah, and they're going for Zelia. Good stacks, by the way, for Medivh. He's sitting at 21 now. Nothing insane yet, but again, if he can get all of that done by the time they hit level 10, that would be the best situation for him, considering that you don't want to go up against heroic abilities. The power spike is pretty huge with those. It makes it easier for the opponent to drop you. 27, 29 stacks for Vala. Yeah, they're not doing well. They're scaling. They're scaling nicely. And especially Mediv. Mediv is always... It always seems that as soon as you cross over 35 stacks on Mediv, you find yourself attacked 
over and over again, always in trouble, and are about to die. That happened so many times during the playoffs and qualifiers, it's just nasty. So Hazu is at 29. That's the moment when you are getting closer and closer to completing this. And we'll see if he can pull that off. Would we'll definitely give them a bit more damage, which is kind of neat. And yeah, they go for the boss at the top. So it's a boss for boss play that we see between the two teams now. Everybody is just going in to make that happen before the next tribute is uh, happening on the map. So that's kind of an important one. And yeah, now we'll see. Now there were a couple of changes also to Vala. She's still getting played as you obviously see, but Hot Pursuit as a level 7 talent got nerfed a little bit, so the extra movement speed got reduced from 2.5% per stack to 2%. One of the reasons for sure why we're now seeing an adjustment on the level 7. So Nikki's been playing around with some of the heroes that were changed in the patch in the last series already, going for Nazebo multiple times. But now it's also affecting the build, at least in game number 1, that he's using for Vala. Tribute is up, that would be the second one. The pressure and the damage negated by the portal so far. But there is a zone happening and only one team has level 10. That's why the Hardos are so careful here now. And Dehaka is at the bot lane since he's the one who is trying to get the experience for them. But they're also breaking through the top wall. They're trying to take that fountain down first and foremost. But also hoping for a kill of course. Good jet propulsion from Dequazas. The portal came in. Hazoops is sitting at 30 stacks now. And with level 10, we got the ley line into the apocalypse. So they got the combo. The Haka is defending the bot lane. Could come up here to help out. Already Brightwing gets interrupted by the ley line. Where's the Apoch when you need it? The Quasar Dino. They're making the plays this time for Vala. And the Apoch never came through here. Now the red team is cursed. They ate this one. The combo against Brightwing. That's a kill. That's a double. They get both of them. But Mitif, no. Mitif died in the back line and lost all of his stacks. Didn't I just talk about it? He was close to 35 and he just died. Zelia and Dino are trying to get away. And thanks to the curse, they're able to do that. Falset is about to take down the top. Zelia dodging out on the tongue. Absolutely insane. Hobbity hop, little dwarf. All of the forts about to fall. Brightwing is not able to save Falstead here. Instead, Banana H is down at the bottom. Here, another quick look at that last fight, by the way. Just to give you guys a bit of an idea. But yeah, just look at that battle. God, they came out. Brightwing now dying at the bot lane. The combo with the Apoch and then Blaze dies. Brightwing dies. That's how they get the entire fight started up. But now that curse, of course, wrecked havoc. Three forts have been eliminated. They're saving their keeps for now. Four kills to two. Brightwing dying. That was big. But it's just insane that Mediv died and his stacks got lost. That's just incredible. It's always the same, isn't it? And that's why I every time highlight that for Medivh it's just so important to try and complete that quest before level 10 is hit on the other side. Because the power spikes that hit with that make it so much harder for Medivh to escape when the opponent is really dedicating some effort and taking him down. So in an ideal world you always want to uh, complete it beforehand, but that didn't happen here. Now we got the level 13 in. Oh, well we're going to talk about Vala in just a moment. Not going for Gloom here, another talent that was nerfed. Yeah, Gloom was nerfed once again. But we have the Haka coming in and missing the Tong. There we go. And Nick is, of course, now in a bit of a different position with his playstyle as well. Portals are coming out. Zelia's in trouble. He uses his avatar to get away. Turn around and tense here. The Quasar could go for the jet propulsion. So far, he doesn't. And there's the bronze be at range. Level 13 talents on both sides. A few stacks coming together for Vala. For Hazu, it's going to take a long time for him to get anywhere near completed baseline quest. And here comes the next hit. Good move with... Oh, Leyline. Is the Apo coming out too? No, no apocalypse here. No apocalypse. Leyline came out, stopped them for a short amount of time. Nick still dishing some damage out. There's the bunker and the Apoch. Hazu gets away, barely. Copenhagen low. He's not going to be that lucky. The Arca is dead. No counter kill. They're on the run. And Team Wa is crushing them. Rega with the attempt at self ancestral. That didn't work. But Benny is dying too. And Team Wa is cleaning house. On the level 13, the siphoning arrow, as already pointed out, so a bit of a change on Bala's build. Not only the level 7 got adjusted, but also the level 13, because Gloom got nerfed. Gloom got nerfed, 
and therefore Nick trying to play this out differently. The keep goes down. 10 minutes into the game and the first keep is gone. Once more, whenever they get a lead, Team Wat just murders. Absolutely murders. Vala has 46,000 damage. Easy top damage in the game, but that just doesn't mean jack shit if you are not able to get the kills and gain the momentum. So they find themselves half a level behind. Problematic is, of course, the increased passive experience gain that we see for the blue team because of all the structures they took down. Siege Giants are attacking the fountain and might even drop this one. No. No, not quite. One keep is down. It's the one in the middle. And, yeah. What are we getting here? There's another tribute and this is more of a problem. Yeah. Dehaka comes in. Is he going to be in time? Trying to interrupt. Nope. Boss is taken. Boss is taken. Beautiful jet propulsion. Great job by Blaze. Boss is chipping in. Here comes the APOC. The combo with the ley line. Not really successful. They didn't do a good job this game with the combo. Like, not at all. And now the Haka is down. And that could be the beginning of the end. Dainu. Hazu is trying to get him, but he can't. So now it's a 5 versus 4. In comes the Mighty Gust. Vala is in trouble. Jet Propulsion against Rega. Stormbow follow up doesn't connect. But they are in deep shit now. And the boss is already marching through the bot lane trying to drop this. Blaze goes down. Maybe some hope for them after all. Brightwing is also eliminated, but the Stormbolt takes Rhaegar down. Full hit to the face. And that was a big hammer. But they also get the connect on Falstad as Bad Benny finds the perfect angle. It's a 3 versus 2. Vala is dead. I knew. <laughs> He's down too. Zelia, the only survivor here. Spoiler alert, the bottom keep is not going to make it. Don't even have to show that. Five-man team wipe. They take everyone down. Nine kills, two eight. But catapults are already on the core. The boss is marching in. And boy, they are in trouble. Oh, damn. I love how the Hardos are just fighting tooth and nail for every single inch of the map now. But with them losing two of their keeps and this many points on the core, it's nearly impossible to bring this one back. They're going to get the tribute. At least they should. Maybe they're not getting it. Hello? Ha ha ha! Clutch! Frame perfect. Frame perfect by Hazu. But how do you bring this back? How do you bring it back from here? 8 kills to 9. We have 59,000 damage for Allah. And up at the top, they have, of course, the vision. There's one boss still up. The Haka. Thankfully, they have a global. Without a global, this would be over. But with the Haka, you can at least control the side lane a bit. But it is still problematic. They go for boss because they know they have to throw a little bit of a Hail Mary. Do they like that idea? Probably not. Do they? But they have to. Leyline into APOC. They need a good one. They need a good one, and where is it? Here comes the boss, already locking down Muradin. Boss gets still fought over. Hazu Ops, there's the Gust, used early, very early. Tribute is spawning, and they're making the play for it. Leyline is there, Apocalypse is there. They got the tools, they got the tools, and they're going for the boss. Gets taken down, there's the portal, they're taking it. Boss is taken. Can they prevent the kill? Essence is used, and so is the Ancestral. Here comes the Apoc, and this time the combo connects, and Blaze is down. False, that is dead. It's a double kill. The one time they set the combo up properly and they get the kill. Zelia on the move. Everybody else is down here chasing Banana and Dainu. And Brightwing is already in some trouble but gets away with another blink kill. Muradin on the other hand. Zelia, is he gonna fall? Where's that jump when you need it, Muradin? Where's that jump? There it is. The doggy is on the prowl though. They go for Zelia and they take him down. Top keep is also in trouble. They need to go for a kill right here, right now with the boss. Big fight over the boss. This is how they locked it in. They were able to grab it, and the ley line setup was just absolutely on point. But now they have to go for it, and I think they're going to try to end the game here. It's tough. It's really tough, but they need to somehow bring it back. This is the only chance. Keep is down. Catapults are moving in. Three. They need to go for the finishing move through the top lane, and it's nearly impossible. It's a five versus four at this point. The ley line is back. The apocalypse isn't. They need to go for that core. The boss is nearly eliminated. They go for the birdie, and the birdie! 
when they did it, they took the bird down. The birds, the word down goes false. That the ley line, they go for the core. Are you fucking kidding me? They're going for the kill and they win the game. They win game number one. GG. The Hados with the victory on the first map. Unbelievable. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two, an insane finish on the first map. The Hados were under so much pressure. They lost the keep in the mid lane, they lost the keep at the bottom of the map, and it looked like an inevitable win for the blue team. But then, it's a team fight around the top boss, and they finally lock in that ley line and Apocalypse. They get the kill against Blaze and Falstad, and then they do the only thing that they can do. They try to go for Hell Mary move through the top lane, and I don't know what to tell you, but it worked. So they lock in the victory. They have the lead. Towers of Doom is the second map, and <laughs> Team Wah needs to bring it back now. They're not going to be too happy about the outcome on the first map, considering how far ahead they were. But, well, that's sometimes how it goes. 6.5 out of 10 moment for the Hardos. A huge success there for them. Okay, so with that, we have Junkrat getting uh, banned and already the ban on Lucio. So we're going full on out on the Overwatch bans again. But are we banning in Uberak? Do they on this map also decide that they don't want to go up against Zelias and Uberak? It really feels that Zelias is just going to play either Mirrodin or Nubarak, whatever he gets, and he's fine with that. I think we had one match in the qualifiers where he played Diablo, and that was also pretty terrifying. And that's a map where you can play Dibbles. But I suppose that <laughs> there's the Nubarak ban actually from uh, the blue team this time. Okay. Yeah. I guess teams are also looking a bit at whether or not we're going to get an early Stuko for something. I still expect that we're having uh, probably the Haka taken early. Now Leo, as I mentioned in the patch that dropped just a few hours ago, was also slightly changed because Blizzard wanted to open up his level 4 talent. It was more or less a given that you had to... Go oh, there's a Dehaka ban, alright. So no Dehaka on this one. It was a given that you had to go for Neil Peasants and therefore uh, Blizzard tried to open that up, made it baseline so to say and yeah, so Leo is now even more of an option. Leo and Blaze are probably your best two options when you're trying to go for the rotation between the mid and the top lane now. There's Malfa Ale that you could also go for but when we're talking about the usual suspects, nice those two would definitely fit. Now Nick is giving Vala a shot again, worked on the last map even though it got, was a bit touch and go and they go for Medivh once more. Hazu maybe wants to make up for his death at 30-35 stacks or whenever that happened. So they go for the same kind of play, likely resulting in a Diablo ban from the blue team. To be fair, they didn't really get a lot of synergy out of Medivh and Diablo in the first map. I mean, it was kind of crazy how little they got out of that combo. But when it mattered most, they locked it in. Now, we have the birdie again. So, Brightwing and Fawcett are already providing a lot of global play to uh, the blue team, which is really, really nice for them. Mirrodin for Zelia, again, with the ban on Anubarak. That doesn't come as a big surprise. I talked about this earlier. But Falstad, he can... I mean, who else could they pick that really gets some counter pressure? It's not really a whole lot. So Falstad is definitely going to run the map for them. And with Medivh and Vala, we'll see what they can pull off here. Nick was experimenting a little bit with the level 7 and level 13 talents, and both of them got nerfed. But I could totally see him readjusting just slightly. And yeah, again, one of the issues is that, at least for the day, the players didn't really have a whole lot of time to... Uh, go through the patch. It literally dropped before one of the matches today. So there's not a lot of try mode, a lot of games that they could play to just see, okay, how much of an impact does this really have on our playstyle. For the second day, that's not going to be a big issue, but at least here people are figuring it out as they go. Urel is in and we get Stukov. Stitches got banned, no kidnap combo. Again, you see the Medivh on the other side and you want to eliminate the kidnap combo. So that's exactly what happened. That's what happened in game number one. That's what's happening in game number two. Sylvanas also gets obliterated and banned out because they don't want to deal with all of that pressure you can build up with her whenever you win a team fight. Take down a couple of bell towers and then decide the game in your favor. Leo and Tychus. All right. Yeah. We'll see what Benny locks in at the front. Diablo is open, so he could literally go for it again. 
maybe after all the missed Leyline Apocalypse plays in game number one, uh, Team Wa is not really afraid of it. But Benny also says, you know what, we're not going to go for that this time. Instead, they're going to go for Garrosh. Obviously, one of the issues is also if you're up against Murden and Brightwing, whenever that Leyline pops out, all that the other team has to do, which they, by the way, did multiple times, one of the reasons why it missed oftentimes, was that... You just use a Stormbolt or Polymorph, and then Diablo can't follow up on it. Anyways, game number two, Team Wah against the Hardos, everybody. Towers of Doom. Game number two, Towers of Doom, Azerite on Falstad for the blue team. We have Dequaza on Leoric, Banana H on Brightwing, and Dino is playing Tigers in our second game of the Best of Five series. Zelion Mirrodin, everybody, once again. House Ops is, of course, trying to lock in the Arcane Rift. <laughs> he got so close last time, but it seems it's, it's the Medivh curse, isn't it? Either way, uh, we have House on Medivh again. Bad Benny is playing Garrosh this time. Nick on Vala. Stukov played by Yasu. And Copenhagen plays Urel. And that leads us into the second game. And it is incredible that the Hardos are ahead now. But how did that affect Team Wah? There's the flip, there's the jump. Ooh, that's a lot of stacks for Hazo. Ooh, that is a ton of stacks for Medivh. Are you kidding me? He's already at 10. Nick vaulting forward, being hyper aggressive. He can make those plays now because he has a Medivh behind him. That helps him with all of this. And that was a great start, at least for the stacks. Hazo already sitting at 10 stacks this early in the game. That's incredibly solid for him. And he can attempt to follow up on that, of course. We also have stacking for Falstead, so the birdie went back into the Gathering Storm as the level 1 talent. Means that Boomerang should be the follow-up on level 7. And I suppose that Paralyzing Rage on level 4 will be the adjustment made by Leoric, considering that he doesn't go have to go for Neil Peasants any longer. Now the 1 minute mark has passed in the game, which means that the teams are currently going for their pumpkins. So that's the next move here, right out of the gate. I don't really think that we're gonna have a big invade and well just as I say it's Celia makes some moves with the rest of them towards the pumpkin camp on the right side but okay they decide against it we currently have oh there's the jump hello Celia the dwarf might be in a bit more trouble the Stormbolt hits Garrosh down here Nick and Hazo are both getting attacked and Hazo's gonna make it out there's like 14 stacks now pumpkins against pumpkins and well these bad boys connect so one of the towers is already gone now there's the Paralyzing Rage, as already expected. And... Yeah, we're in level 4. We also have the In The Rhythm now. In The Rhythm for Tychus. And this is another good indicator of how versatile Tychus level 4 can be these days. We have In The Rhythm this time, but we've also seen the Master Assassin, the bigger they are. So you can really go to pretty much every single talent on that setup. The Thirst for Battle on level 4 now, for our boy. Okay, so a bit of a cooldown reduction, which also, of course, means that we're not looking at Indomitables this time for Garrosh. Another hit, Dequaza. Ah, careful. The stacks coming together for Vala is really, really important here. 19 stacks also for Medivh. <laughs> ah, Medivh. Such a weird hero. If he can get the quest completed, his damage is absolutely significant and really makes a difference. If he can't, he still adds a lot, but it's not quite as impactful, obviously. We have 13 stacks for Falset now, 19 for Medivh as he holds the bot lane, and the first objective spawns. The triple altar phase is about to hit, and it is a party time. So, Copenhagen at the top right goes for the channel. Over here, we have Banana H doing the same thing, and down at the bottom of the map, interrupts are happening. There's a bit of a flip on Zelia, and the dwarf is dead. The Dwarf is dead. Brightwing was a bit too late. Now two of the altars have already been taken. And at the top of the map we have Leoric pissing Ural off a little bit. As Copenhagen is attempting to get the channel through. He's like, get away from me. But he is insisting. Yeah, okay. Now that uh, now that heroes are slowly rotating over towards Ural, he's letting it go. And there are the four shots for the red team. Boomerang is in. As already pointed out, that was the obvious talent to take. We have with level 7 now also, they give him the axe! No Suljin in this one, but Murden represents. And again, the Frost Shot, so no hatred stacks. That talent got nerfed on Vala, 
And therefore, he is still moving for the... Oh, 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 oh hello, Team Zelia, 5 HP. And there it is, the kill. Guys, the Hardos. The Hardos are starting to crush. Look at Azerite. He's down. Banana H is also going to die. And all of a sudden, we have a significant lead again for the Hardos. They won the first game. Let's take another look at this. They won the first game. And now they're just doing better and better and better here. If they gain the momentum in the series, that would just be incredible. After they killed Muradin, they take down the birdie and they drop right wing. And now they have the pressure play at the bottom of the map that they can use to open this up. Keep in mind how these playoffs, uh, sorry, how the qualifiers worked out. How many tournaments did we have where the Hardos and Team Wah faced off against each other and the blue team won? Four? Five? So... It was really the team to beat, but the Hardos are in the lead now. Not only in the series, but also on map number two. It's not an insane lead, but they are ahead. Now the camp gets taken by the blue team. They're definitely not giving up here. They're clawing their way to another lane push topside. With Leo forcing Urel to stay a bit longer because of all of this. But down here, another portal. Oh, and a few more stacks for Hazu, who's now sitting at 27. And we're, of course, approaching heroic abilities again. So, with this, can Hazu get the stacks together? There's the port, there's the shield for Vala. Nick needs to be alive. Level 10 is ready. They got the ley line, and here we go. Ley line is in. Can they follow up on it? They try to go for Azerite, who barrel rolls out of it immediately. Yazu is on the channel. He's going to complete it. And that's another four shots fired, which equalizes the points on the core. Bam. 32 to 32. Level 10 for a few more seconds. A small advantage. And they are using it down here. Yeah, Hazel gets a few more stacks. Sits at 31 now. 37 for Vala. 38 for Tychus. So he's getting some increased duration on his minigun that he could definitely use in the later stages of the game quite easily. But we are keeping our eye on Medivh. He's getting so close now. Can he complete it this time? Medivh completing his level 1 is incredibly impactful. The cooldown reduction alone is fantastic. And you can just spam it out. You have a damage increase and you have cooldown reduction. This is a ridiculously powerful quest talent. But it's of course also something that as we've seen before. Is not always easy to complete. Either way. Damage output 21,000 for Vala. And Medivh by the way is sitting at 10k. 10,000? That's not shabby. Look at the birdie. Look at Leo. They are both at 6,500. So Medivh has already a decent amount of damage here, but it will increase much more significantly if he is able to complete that quest. Four kills to zero. Pumpkins are taken on the map again. The leading experience is not really that big for the Hardos. Kill count gave them, of course, a bit of an upper hand. But now there's a double altar up on the map. Now, traditionally, double altar... Top side is an even trade. Normally, nobody's making any big plays for it. Usually, it's a gentleman's agreement, and everybody just says, like, yeah, we might set some heroes close to you and see what we can do. But the commitments are rarely made for that, unless you already have a big advantage. But they are really trying to get the top lane kill, aren't they? Copenhagen, so far all alone against Equaza. The problem is also that Medivh can, of course, always sniff this out. And he's alone. Medivh is all alone here. Uh, careful, Hazu. Alright, Urel is already setting up. They want to go for him. Zelia, he has to hop out. Uh-oh. And, well, there we go. But Dino... Alright, they use the ley line. They use the ley line and zone them out. False stats. Yeah, they come in from all angles now, aren't they? So some ults had to be used, but at the end of the day, it's an altar for an altar. So we're still looking at a dead even setup on points. Muradin gets attacked again. Zelia was jumpy throughout the entire tournament. 34 stacks now for Hazu and a level 13. Oh boy. Virulent reaction is in. One of the most important talents for Stukov. For control. And Nick is continuing with the same build that we've seen him use in the first game. Siphoning arrow on level 13 as he drops Gloom. Gloom got nerfed. And therefore... Not a thing anymore. Oh, that's a ballsy move from the blue team. Hello. Leyline isn't ready, and they know that. They also have the Gust. They might let this one slide, or they might not. They're going for it. They're trying to go for the play. There's the jump. Oh, Vala. 
potential drop against Leo. Everybody low, the shots are fired. And the quest is completed for Medivh, but Garrosh also died. Big win for the blue team. They get the whole boss points. They shoot the shots and they kill Garrosh. But then again, they're losing Leo here. Odin gets popped and everybody else is also rather low. So they got to be super careful as another ley line connects. Here comes the jump, but as a right, the barrel rolls out once more. Portal allows them to escape, but just having the quest on Medivh completed is, of course, a big relief, at least for Hazu. That's important. That's super important now. Big fly down to the bot lane. Yeah, Azerite is prepping for an early camp as the next altar is spawning in 13 additional seconds. Damage output. Oh, they're going for another potential hit here. All right, what about Medivh? Can he get some uh, more shots fired? Portal was there. Five kills to one. Was well, the first kill for Team War. The first kill that they got today. There's the tomb. Zones them out, but not enough for the altar to be channeled. Birdie is still there. Gust is an option. Quest is completed. <laughs> yeah, they have to retreat here a bit. And Brightwing now has all of a sudden a lot of space to work with. But Hazu is, of course, flying there. And is able... Oh, oh Hazu. Yeah, there's no Entomb. Medivh is going to be fine. The fight is centering around it. Another interrupt as the lurking arm comes in. Nick is a bit low. Doesn't eat the grenade. Dino is trying to zone him. And they're creating all the space for Banana to get the full on channel. And that's another four shots fired, which is now dropping the core of the Hardos down to 20 points. They're trying to go for the birdie. And they are locking in a kill. The bird is dead back into the KFC basket. And the ley line is trapping Muradin. Can they get the kill here? They're trying. Zelia with the avatar. Zelia, Brightwing helping out. Banana. Oh, another portal. Brightwing with another blink kill. And they are focusing on Dino. They take him down. And now they're chasing the fruit fly. Yep. Trashwing is dead. And now with those three kills, the bot lane is, of course, wide open. Leo is up at the top. They're making the play down here. Zelia is able to get out. 42,000 damage now for Vala. 21,000 for Medivh. And it looks like a bit of map control is being accomplished here by the Hardos. They lock in that bottom bell tower. And that leads them to a 5 versus 3 situation on the map. Dequaza was trying at the top lane to at least reciprocate with a bit of counter pressure on the top bell tower. But of course with Copenhagen on Urel counteracting that, it's not happening. Level is, sorry, level 16 on both sides and 8 kills against 1. If the Hardos win this one, you know what's getting banned next match. You know what's getting banned. There's no way that they're going to allow for another Medivh pick if the Hardos lock in a victory here. So, this is just insane. If you guys watch the qualification tournaments, if you watch the qualifiers and you look at this, it is just crazy. Team Wah dominated. They dominated. They turned from Team Wah into Team Exactly. So, eight kills to one. Channel is happening. Bad Benny. That's ten potential shots off the opponent's core. Falstead got the one at the top left. Shots are fired, 5 points down, 23 to 17, and Ural is locking in another 5 for the boys in red. BAM! Straight to the heart of the issue. 18 to 17 points right now. With that, we have 54 stacks now for Vala, 55 for Tychus, and another camp is claimed. Now, there is pressure at the top side still. Urel has some trouble. She's going for a very safe rotation all the way because she knows that there's a potential trap set up for her. So Copenhagen is missing out. A little bit of time that would have allowed him to maybe... Oh, well, hello. Team, 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 team. There's another setup against Zelia. Brightwing with the help. Leila not followed, but they go for Leo. And Dequaza is in trouble. Oh, and he gets saved by the blink heel. No way. What a save. Holy hell. One more hit and he would have been down. An auto attack. But look at this. The kill against Vala. The kill against Vala. Dainu. With a big hit, Vala down, 8 kills to 2, finally the red team bringing it back a little bit. Yeah, there we go. You get the move at the bottom left now as they are heading for the bell tower to reclaim it, make it a 4 versus 4 situation again. 
Already the fly into the middle. They're trying to gust them out. Yasu. Oh, run, baby, run. <laughs> Copenhagen would also be here to create a bit more space for them and help them out. But it was a nice attempt to force a fight. It backfired a little bit. And funny as it is, it also resulted in the bell tower at the bottom of the map not being taken. Now, this one is, of course, with a grenade now going to be locked in by Dino. But still, it's kind of funny. Half a level, that's the advantage for the blue team. These guys are fighting tooth and nail here. I mean, both teams. They're fighting for every single inch of the map. Zelia with a missed jump. Brightwing with a heal attempt. They're in trouble. They're in real trouble. They're in so much trouble. Zelia is alive and he's dead. Zelia is down. Leo is down. And Brightwing is escaping. Or is he? Brightwing. Hazu, the kill. Getting the kill here. Boy, boy, boy. What a setup again. The Hados. Tigers is dead too. These guys are absolutely out of control. Five man wipe. <laughs> yes, maybe. No. <laughs> They're going for all of it. Take another look. Take another look. Two kills easily. Hazu with a big chase on Brightwing. Locks in the kill against the fruit fly and then Tychus gets chased to death at the top. Now all of a sudden the boss is up for grabs. We have a level 20 on the board. It is so absolutely insane. Every single qualification tournament that we've seen between these two teams. Team wah, murdered them. They murdered. And now they're just on... They're just... They're on the receiving end of a beating. 12 kills to 2. That's a 10 kill difference between the two teams. The shots are fired. Nearly dropped them down into the single digits. It's 10 points to 13. The level 20 gives them the advantage. Leyline into Medivh cheats. Decimate gets upgraded into the Deadly Calm. And we got the Far Flight Quiver. Bot lane pressure. Here we go. One hit after another against the bottom bell tower. But of course now we got Team Wah with their own level 20. And that is buried alive. And already we got Dequaza trying to flank in. Hazo's providing the vision. He's doing what he can here. Brightwing with the invisible friends. <laughs> I always knew that Brightwing had no friends. Blizzard didn't have to go for the talent name. But I appreciate it. Making it clear to everybody. 61,000 damage for Vala. 44,000 for Tychus. Medivh is at 32k. That makes him the third highest damage dealer in the game. Just saying. Down here. Chunking against Zelia. Yeah. And they get some solid hits in. Damn son. Banana Age gets flattened as the goat jumps in on Brightwing. Easy kill. Copenhagen with great URL plays here. And now it's a 4 versus 5. It's a 4 versus 5 and they are in trouble. And if another portal comes out, there might be a few more kills. And they're trying to set those up. Not too aggressively. Nice trap. Really nice trap against Stukov. And they get the kill, but Leo pays with his life for it. They could get the kill against Bad Benny on the other hand. He is barely making it out. Gets the globe and Dainu. He also dies. Hazu with the save. The pause. Everybody on the way back out here. Tactical pause as we have Tyker's fall. Guys, it's a four versus two right now. Four versus two. Bad Benny still safe. And what's the situation? We have the top bell tower taken by the blue team. Top bell tower was claimed by them earlier. It's a 5 versus 3 situation. So now at the bottom of the map, they're going to try and take this one. And they will delay the channel on the altar for as long as they can. And it's a big gap anyways. Right now with 72 stacks for Vala, we have the opportunity to take another 4 points off the blue team's core. And that, that's what they're going for here. Another 4 points are going to be fired here. And that puts them down to 6 in total. This is getting clutched. This is going to go down to the wire. Six points to 13. Three kills to 15 now. 63 stacks. Four Tigers. And top side, they need to deal with this. Yeah, they need to take those pumpkins down. That's exactly what they do. Blue team, they're trying to steal this one. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Are we going to see the portal? No. No portal. Too many heroes still at the top side. They didn't want to fight this. Even with Tigers missing. They knew they couldn't go for it. Oh, we're talking about missing. There's still a few of them missing. Leyline. They're trying for the kill. Banana H. And he's dead again. Brightwing gets crushed. Brightwing gets crushed. 
Fruit Fly is down. They went for the Fly Swatter and they took Brightwing apart. A staggered death, and that is one that the blue team cannot afford. Pressure at the bot lane. Three potential shots are going to be fired. What about the boss? As a minute and 50 seconds, that's plenty of time. Falstead, by the way, gets attacked now too. By the way, no Manticore. Again, punishment. We've seen him previously and we're seeing it again here. They go for the punishment. Muradin is still under pressure, even without Manticore. We've now seen multiple times talking about him. Here he is, gets stunned out again. There's another one. Zelia in trouble. Wind tunnel. There's the Entomb. The shield is there. It saves bad Benny. And the portal was ready another second later. One pumpkin made it through. And the core is down to five points. Five points to 13. And two altars popping up on the map right here. This is the moment. 80,000 damage for Vala. Portal set up. They want to take this. If they take the bell tower. If they take the bell tower and then one altar. They win the game. All they got to do now. But they can't. They don't have enough time. They're trying to get the shots here. Four shots fired already. Five points to nine. <laughs> they would tie it. They would tie the points on the core if they lock this one in. Falstead at the bottom of the map. Look at this. Takes the bell tower. Only three potential shots fired by the Hardos. Only three. And Copenhagen gets them. <laughs> yeah, there we have it. Two point. One point. They got the four. Ah, they got the top, they got the top. They got the top in time. Four shots fired, they just delayed the loss of the map. But the top still got locked in in time to give them four shots. But they didn't lose the game, you know. With, with Falstad getting the bottom bell tower back, it's still up. Now, they're trying to get this one too. That opens up a few options, but it doesn't change the situation in the game. One more altar and the game is over. One single altar for the Hardos and the game is over. If you win the boss, then you win it too. And they have the ley line. Leyline against Gust. Leyline against Gust and Buried Alive if they want to make the play here. Shots fight against Zelia. One hit after another. And, oh, bad Benny. Might have to pop the fountain here. Might have to go for the cooldown. 1.29. <laughs> oh, baby. They try. They try. They at least threaten it. They threaten it. They force the reaction. Out of the team in blue, the flip, the stun, and is it a kill? They go for Zelia, he's incredibly low, but he gets away. Bad Benny, he might be the one in trouble here. He heals himself up, the ley line is out, and they buy themselves some time, but Nick is eating a ton of damage from Tychus. Single alt at the bottom of the map, there's two points that they have to control. Benny is dead, the blue team, did they just pull it off? <laughs> Did they pull a comeback off? They have to go for the boss up at the top. They can't leave that open. They need to deal with it. Hazu is there. Doesn't have the ley line. Urel on their way to the bottom of the map. There's two points that they got to control. Copenhagen is trying to isolate that. Tychus is coming in here at the top. They're fighting. They're fighting again. They're trying to threaten the boss. Bottom of the map. Dino against Copenhagen. Garrosh isn't here. Are they moving down? Are they staying top? Are they trying to go for the boss? They're threatening it again. Yazo's already moving in. Banana H just moved back down. The shots get fired. The shots get fired. Four to one. Four to one. <laughs> oh my god. This is going to go down to the last minute, isn't it? If the three pumpkins that just got locked in make it, then it is all about the boss now. Three pumpkins, that is three points. One, two, one. Garrosh is not back yet, but the ley line is. They got the ley line. Guys, this move wins the game. This move wins the game. Copenhagen jumping out. The buried alive misses. Buried alive misses. Bad Benny is back. Bad Benny is back to business. Once again, Odin. Odin gets Pop Brightwing with a heal attempt. Mighty Gust, Wind Tunnel. Nick is dead. Nick is dead. No ley line used in the fight. Nick is dead. And now Yazu is going down to the bottom of the map. This has to be lights out. The boss is getting attacked. Hazu is going to try and steal the boss with the ley line. One point against one point. Stukov at the bottom of the map doing what he can. Benny over here buying a little bit more time for the team. 
The hit and the kill as Garrosh goes down. The only chance is a steal by Hazu, and that's nearly impossible right now. Urel and Mediv, the only survivors here together with Stukov. And they're trying to buy time. Double altar on the map. This is lights out right here. Stukov is dead. There's no way. There's too much happening. Stormbolt against Hasu. This is it. This is game. They make it happen. One channel, two channel, one point against a point. It's a victory for the blue team. Unbefucking believable. They turned it. What is this series? The winner bracket final is insane as team Wah ties the best of five. Battlefield of Eternity, the third map in the series is tied. For the longest time, it looked like the Hardos are going to win game number two. Uh, really, with Leyline and everything that they had, it felt like they are going to lock in that victory on uh, Towers of Doom. And I don't know, it just Team Brat never gave up and they always clawed their way back and then towards the end they just won these fights time and time again. I, I can't shake the feeling that at some point maybe a different strategy would have been okay. You look at Hazu and he held back the ley line for so long and you can clearly tell that one of the ideas was to hold the ley line for when the boss is taken so they can steal it. But it felt that ley lines could have at times saved Vala, decided the fight in their favor, but it's always just a really, really tough choice to make here. And at the end of the day, it turned out that them being a bit more cautious about these heroic ability cooldowns turned out to be the wrong decision. So Team Wa locked in some solid kills. They dropped Vala multiple times as the first target in these fights. And of course, then were able to snowball it. And towards the end, just chaos everywhere. Since Pumpkins moved to the bot lane, you had altars popping up, the boss being fought over. There was just so much stuff and it was insane. So now we're going into our third map, Battlefield of Eternity. And I'm curious. I'm really curious who takes the lead now. We have Vala banned. Nick locked it in twice. Also the ban on Tracer. It was kind of funny the last time that the two of them played Battlefield of Eternity because I distinctly remember a conversation where they were talking about how uh, map was picked and nobody really knows exactly how to approach it right now. And I don't really think that has necessarily changed. So they couldn't just decide on what's the best strategy to play Battlefield of Eternity with all the changes that came in through the previous patch. And now, of course, we have another patch on top of that. But Stukov is locked in as the first pick. It's a bit about the immortal damage you would expect the Li Ming to uh, come through. Yeah, well, there she is. Li Ming gets taken. Azerite is the one to lock her in together with Muradin. So now that Anubarak is banned, the trend continues for Zelia. Dwarf all the way. Rumor has it that Zelia just appreciates the majestic beard that Muradin is rocking since he himself can't grow one. Uh, but yeah, our baby face on uh, the blue team is of course absolutely crushing it on the dwarf, so good for him. And with the two picks now coming through, it's Dibbles and Hanzo! Hanzo arrow into a potential apocalypse. Now, in previous games when they try to go for the Leyline Apocalypse, keep in mind that Diablo was multiple times interrupted by either a stun or a lurking arm. This time they have Stukov. He could even go for the Lightning Breath. It's not like this is a setup where you have to go for Apocalypse. You don't. Okay. On the ban side. You... <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good ban. Last map in particular was one where I think... Uh, I think when we're talking about Banana Age, he was probably so frustrated with Urel. Because Urel targeted him time and time again. And you gotta give it to Copenhagen. He crushed with her. He had so many fantastic plays. Yeah, Bananas Ana gets banned out because Bananas Ana is pretty bananas. Whenever Ana gets played by Banana, then it's a Bananas game for Ana. But now that we have her banned out, he will have to fall back on a different hero. We could even see Brightwing again. But one way or another, the URL ban makes sense. He was probably pretty frustrated with this. Okay, so Blaze gets locked in. So we have already stun after stun with the Jet Propulsion into Muradin. And then even more of a follow-up with the Malfurion Lawn that he uh, can drop whenever he gets the roots on them. 
And now, with the last two picks, we still need range damage. Hanzo is a good start, but they need more than that. And Nick, of course, is always a bit of an X-Factor setup. So is he... Maybe they go for a triple melee. If they want to play this hyper-aggressive, they can just simply set Nick up on a melee assassin. Turanda. And Imperius. Okay, they're trying to make Turanda work. With a big, ex with a big difference here, it's a double support. Double support Turanda. So it's not a solo support Turanda, which a couple of teams have been trying to make work. Some with success, by the way. Not really to an extent where you would say, alright, this is the new meta, but some of them made it work. Now we have Turanda and Stukov, so you have extra damage against the Immortal, you have the Hunter's Mark against targets that Diablo can lock in, and the follow-up stun, of course, whenever he makes an engage. And Sylvanas on the other side. Another potential interrupt here after level 10. Yeah? Who takes the lead? It's a best of five series, it's the winner bracket final, whichever team wins is making it into the grand final right away. And the loser of this series drops down into the loser's bracket. So, ladies, let's go. Team Wah against the Hardos. Team Wah against the Hardos. Game number three. And it is Crowd Control City. Because we have on both sides an enormous amount of CC for the two teams. Dequaza is playing Blaze. We have Azerite on Liming, Banana Age on Malfurion, Dino on Sylvanas. Can either go for the Interrupt, can go for the Wailing Arrow or Mind Control after level 10. Zelia with Murden. But there's so much CC, especially on the side of the of the Hardos. They can initiate with Nick on Imperius, with Bad Benny on Diablo. They have potential follow-ups from Copenhagen on Stukov, Yasu on Toranda, and even Hard Ops can chip in the Dragon's Arrow to make this even more of a problem. So there are huge CC trains that can crush anyone that gets hit by them. A lot of control and of course you got to be super careful around all of this. Now with Sylvanas at the bottom of the map they are already doing damage. They are very careful about it though since again there is a lot of control with all of those stuns that they can stack and here's the first one one two and yeah they get zelia pretty low now they don't have stukov here stukov is currently solo laning against uh yeah against blaze but that showcases yeah that showcases also really well how dangerous this lineup is the first one to be heavily attacked was zelia and then dino shortly afterwards experiences the same treatment <laughs> and that, that was definitely not something that he enjoyed, I can tell you that much. So we have Toronto once again in the game. This time with a double support, and there's the stun. I love these engages. I mean, that is Zelia nearly dying. Zelia gets nearly crushed by this. And it's so reminiscent of the days of old whenever you had Toronto just played with a tank that had a great engage. And it's difficult to make Toronto work these days as a solo support for the reasons pointed out already over and over again. She's very squishy, she doesn't have the great escape tools, so positioning is everything. But she has been made work in some instances, and here they are getting the kill, even though the stun didn't connect because Bad Benny was a little bit too jumpy on his ability. But they have the double support now that Stukov joined the fight, and that allows Diablo to re-engage. They're looking for more kills, and another stun connects as Turanda is able to lock one more in. So I really, really like what we're seeing happening here. Team Wa, by the way, they locked in the camp. So they got the camp. They got the camp, they didn't get the kill. It was the Hardos that locked in the kill against Muradin. But just seeing these combos is awesome. And I'm, I'm a Turanda fan. I really think that she's a lot of fun as a hero and the times where she was picked in HTC over and over again were always enjoyable. Now with the double support, that's pretty cool. And I like that as a strategy also from the Hardos. We've seen so many double support plays in the past couple of days and weeks. And here now we have a different variation of exactly that happening. So right now, as you can tell, the teams are both looking to just set up for the first Immortal. The first stun was nice, but you need a lot more than that if you want to pull ahead here. With level 4, we get Eloon's Chosen. We have two camps attacked, left side, right side. You want to go for the Shamans. The threat level is a little bit higher from the blue team because they have Sylvanas, so they can threaten that bot lane even more. And with Muradin locking in, they are, they are taking on both of those. Ooh. Both towers down. That makes this a big problem. That makes this a very, very big problem now because, oh, well, maybe not. If they get the kill, then we'll take that back. But Azerite gets out with 100 HP, so there's not a lot left. But he doesn't die, and that's the most important part. 
It still focuses the attention of the blue team a bit longer onto the bot lane than they probably expected. Copenhagen is now getting attacked and he got blindsided by this completely. So that's one kill and that's the second kill. Both of the supports down. And that's the blue team, ladies and gentlemen, taking a lead at the bot lane as they are taking the entire wall down and also getting two kills. So now they have the jump on the Immortal 2. That's a great opening now. Initially, they were the ones suffering the first death, but now they are going for the halftime show and Sylvanas is saving the wall topside as best she can. It also leads to a lead in experience for the blue team. Yeah, so far so good. Well played. Now, that's currently an attempt to go for a big boy immortal here. The defense is up. Maybe a stun into a stun. There it is. And Sylvanas is dead. The Quasar's jet propulsion comes too late to save her. That was a very good combo. Diablo engages into a Tyrande setup. It's honestly a lot harder than it looks. It always sounds so easy, but the timing to have it down properly and really make it work can be very, very annoying, especially when uh, there's a lot of chaos in the game. And we've had so many chaotic fights between the two teams during these two maps. It's getting a bit nasty. But, of course, this is still going to be a win for the blue team, or at least on the Immortal. But at least the shield has been reduced now. And the combo missed this time. But they still have the lurking arm and that's a play skill. So that is getting... <laughs> it's actually a bit weird if you think about it. When all of the supports are there, Bad Benny cannot go for a bad engage. Because all they gotta do is to carpet the floor with stuns and with lurking arms. And they're going to be good on the follow-up. Now Nick also has a stun available. It's a bit attacked here, but I know. Okay, they, Bad Benny had to jump out. But they're burning this one down very, very fast. Yeah, that's... They're not even going to scratch the keep, do they? As uh, Solid 4. Yeah, they're going to get some damage in. All right, all right, all right. But still, it's a decent defense. They lose the wall. It's three kills to two. Stukov this time moved back at the bottom of the map. They can't catch him, at least not that easily. But of course, there's still pressure from the blue team. They always attempt to set Sylvanas up, give her a good position to get some damage through. And yeah, not quite yet. Zelia, topside again. Give him the axe. And at the bottom of the map, it's another camp that is being threatened. And they're switching things up now. So at this point, it's Diablo with both of the supports. Zelia's hitting the wall, but not the hero. It's Imperius is now taking to the side lane, as you kind of would have expected a bit early already. Quest even completed for Bad Benny, which means, of course, that he's now uh, going for the Resurrect here. So he has a respawn. But at the bottom, this is getting nasty, since this is now half the XP... Uh, yeah, roughly half of the hit points are now missing. And it's these small attacks with Sylvanas, these small windows of opportunity that the blue team creates where they can slowly but steadily whittle down the hit points of these structures. Because if you compare what we're having on the map now, the bottom fort has already taken around 50% uh, HP and damage. Down here, the wall is still completely intact. And at the top, it's the same picture. So despite the fact that the Hardos are doing fairly okay in experience, they are falling behind in uh, structures. And that trend hasn't really led to a big problem yet because none of the forts have been destroyed. But it's only a matter of time if it continues at pace. Now, level 10 is likely going to change a lot here. And the heroic abilities will be up in a few more moments. Camps are again taken by both. But with an additional camp at the top lane, you can already see where this is headed. They need to send someone topside. They're losing more and more HP here. So that's a problem. Muradin with the avatar again. Level 10 abilities for the blue team also lead us to a mind control. Stukov is now dealing with the top. Apocalypse is in. And here we have it. Arrow into Apocalypse is now a possibility at least. No ult yet for Taranda. There it is. Goes into the Shadow Stalk. And down at the bottom of the map, Imperius is stopping the lane. Top side, yeah, camp against camp. And the Shaman camp usually takes this one. This battle is no exception. But they are looking for engage now. Look how careful Azerite is. Look at this. He's already blinking away. He knows fully well that if Diablo makes a successful engage on him and he gets flipped into either lurking armor or stun, he's just dead. He knows that 100%. With a Hunter's Mark as a potential follow-up, there's just no chance. So now we got Dequaza on the side with the Snowflake, but the pressure is mounting up and Team Wah is being pushed back a bit. So that's what's happening right now. 
bad Ben. He's still poking. This and he's not the only one. They're slowly but steadily whittling down the hit points on this one. Yeah, there's the setup. They go again for the Quasar. This time the arrow connects. Where's the apocalypse when you need it? Not used just yet. And here comes the delivery system. They go for Malfurion. A poke and the kill. Malf is down and it is time to chase. Malfurion is dead and now they got room to work with. They want Zelia. I'm not so sure if they can get him though. Yeah, that was a good shutdown on Imperius. But that was well done. And of course we take another look at the kill. That was the most important one. Here comes the delivery. Imperius is setting it up for the team. And then with the help of the Apocalypse and the combo of Bad Benny, they get the Malfurion kill, which now leads them into a perfect position on the Immortal. Blaze is trying to stop it. Mind control. The kill. Nick also low. The double. No freaking way. No way. The blue team with a double kill. Th that's insane. They get the double kill here. And all of a sudden. Guys, it's 300 hit points. It's 300 hit points. Tyrande is trying. Tyrande. <laughs> and she got it. She gets it. Likely gonna die for this one though. Yeah, he's going to sit tight. He wants to die as quickly as possible. So commit Sudoku at the so uh, at the bot lane. Honorable Suzuki by Tyrande. That's the end of her. And yeah, it was just a Hail Mary to stop the Immortal. But the fort still falls. Now, Tyrande is sacrificing herself. They have a second support, so they can still do some damage. But it highlights again how crazy this series is. This series is just incredible. It's insane. Game 1, Game 2, I mean, are you kidding me? Now they go for the Quasa, they can't go for the bot lane push, but they want at least to get a kill out of this one. Bunker being used too, it slows it down. Muradin is nearly here, do not tell me he gets away. Are you kidding? Oh, ho, 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 ho. bullseye baby, bullseye. Yeah, they took him down quickly. At this point it was just, yeah, better safe than sorry. Just drop him, just drop him. Easy kill right here. Okay, so we're gonna take another look at his, that hit too. So De Quaza, at least initially, it looks like he might get away, and then he gets an arrow to the face and gets murdered by Tyrande as she connects the, the Luna Flare too. Well done. Yeah, that's that's kind of insane. So bottom of the map, Dino, he might go for another camp. One is still up, but in the middle, there's an engage on Muradin, and they have to help Zelia out. Virulent reaction is now in play. We got level 13 talents on both teams. <laughs> I love it when those connect. <laughs> Honestly, the harsh moonlight is just awesome. Mini Blaze is in. And we could see another fort fall at the top as Li Ming has a lot of space to work with to push the wave back. And maybe get another combo connected, but no, she doesn't want to risk being ganked up on. So instead just moves out. I love this series. This series is awesome. Five kills to five. They are fighting. They are fighting really for every single point of experience here. Every single hit points on the forts. They're going for it time and time again. So, with camps taken and another objective pulling up. That's right, being a bit low here. Yeah, he needs some healing. He needs the Genji treatment. He needs healing and he needs it quickly. Because the next immortal is up in two seconds. So that is the lead likely for the Hardos. Zelia, he again gets engaged upon. There's the stun. Oh, nearly into the immortal stun. That would have been a disaster. Mind control is in. Another storm bolt. Nick with a side engage. Arrow for Li Ming. A poke. And he blinks away from it. They're trying for Muradin again. <laughs> Havoc unleashed in the middle of the map. As they go for the kills. Big stuns coming from Duranda. Interrupts it too. Everybody turns into a pirate. Everybody goes for the old. Arr! And they nearly get a kill against Zelia. They nearly take down Dequaza. But nearly doesn't buy you anything these days. They can't secure the kill. 32,000 damage now for Hanzo. 34,000 for Sylvanas. Bottom under attack. Halftime show locked in. Bad Benny mind control. It's a problem. They are locking them in with a root from Alfuri. And Benny is low. But with a slappity slap slap from Stukov. They're buying a bit more time. It is not enough. 
to save Dibbles though. Here comes the Luna Flare once again. Top side under pressure. The fort is maybe even going to fall here if the next wave comes in in time. At the bottom of the map, they're also eating some dirt here. But everybody is focused on the Immortal. They want to lock this one in. And the blue team is ahead now. They are ahead. Zelia jumping out again. And so is Azerite. Everybody is just trying to get out of harm's way as the CC is nearly connecting. Bad Benny buying a bit of time and space. But at the same time, it, it doesn't really look like they can save this one. They're trying. They're trying to burn it down. And they get really far ahead thanks to the Hunter's Mark. But they are still losing out on it. Barely, but they do. So it is an Immortal for Team Wham. And bot lane is still doing damage. The fort is down. Can they get a kill? That will be the big one right here. They're trying. Azorbs, he's low. He's low. They're trying to turn it once again. And this time they're going for Azerite. Nick is low. He's alive. The Stormbolt doesn't hit. Zelia, Apoch! They're going for the full on slot on Liming. But Azerite gets out of the stun in time to teleport away. What is this? Benny in trouble again. Azorbs, he's low too. And he tries to escape. But he cannot. A double kill. And now the push at the top. At the bottom of the map. The keep has already taken damage. This game is just insane. These kills. These escapes. Everything just so incredibly clutch. The 16 talents giving a big lead now to the blue team. As they go for at least a double keep play. If not more. In comes the stun. The hit on Celia, but it is Imperius that dies. Imperius is down, and this might just be the end of the third game. Is Team Wa taking the lead here? They're scratching the shields. They're trying. Here's the arrow, though. The arrow is in. Benny, can he survive? He doesn't have a lot of stacks left. The shield about to be gone. And Team Wa, they will lock in the victory. The 2-1 lead for the blue team in the best of five series at the winner bracket final. As they take it on Battlefield of Eternity. Game number four. Let's go. Team Wow with a 2-1 lead. What a series. Absolutely amazing. When Tomb of the Spider Queen. And well, here comes the first ban. And once again, it is a Nubarak. By the way, I had to laugh hard earlier because somebody came into the chat and was like, wait a second, Team Wow, what does that mean? Are those the wet ass hamsters? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I thought that was amazing. So, the Hamster Boys on the left side, they were successful on Battlefield of Eternity. It was a fantastic map. And Azerite in particular, some of these fights, I have no idea how he got out of them alive. Li Ming got stunned. It looked like a perm stun. And just before the last auto attack hit, somehow she gets out. It was incredible. So, now that we're heading on to the fourth map, the question is, of course, can the Hados bring it back and now force game five or is it gonna end here for the day and we're having the blue team advance to the grand final and the hardos drop into the lower bracket that's pretty much what we're looking at right now now either way we have for now stukov banned i suppose muradin is definitely an option for our boy zelia but given a map i wouldn't really put it past him to step it up a bit and go for a very different setup now so we'll see yeah, but I'm a bit curious. I mean, Muradin works here too, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but that would really turn him into a two-trick pony. If he goes for Muradin now, that maybe pick Muradin. Just take it away from him. <laughs> Just take Muradin and steal it. The problem is that Zelia is not a player that you can simply ban out like that. But he obviously has a very strong preference for two specific heroes. Vala is banned. Now, again, this is the newest patch. So initially we had teams experiment a little bit with Nazebo, they played Zagara again, and in the last few maps, most of that has disappeared. So we'll have to find out if other teams bring that back, what happens tomorrow when the teams also had some time to toy around with the changes. I mean, as the, as the patch dropped and we saw the first two maps happen, for example, we had more or less, I don't want to say insta logs, but we have very early Deckard Kane picks. But the old geezer hasn't been taken here. 
Tychus and Diablo. There's Zelia with Diablo. He played that once. And with Tychus together, it ensures that you don't have the bigger they are against Diablo. So it's a really nice pick regardless. Tychus, first of all, is great in and of itself. And then you also have Diablo with him, so your opponent can't pick Tychus against you. So that's great too. Now... What do we get from the hardest though? Because for now, I'm most interested... I mean, are we seeing Medivh at some point again? Medivh was super strong for them. Granted, they lost Towers of Doom. But it was still a strong tool. And you can play Medivh here too. Now they have Garrosh. They got Greymane. Uh, don't have to, obviously. But still, it's it's an option. And Lucio has a very early pick. It's one of the first times that Yasuo gets Lucio here. Okay, ban time. Or do they ban it? Nah, Hoga. Hoga for the bot lane pressure. You want to have, of course, your solo laner here. Blaze is up. I mean, everybody's up. Blaze, Urel, both are up. You could go for Leo. We don't even have anyone banned. The first side laner was banned is Hoga, so that's the only thing. That could give Copenhagen his Urel again. Unless, of course, it gets taken. By the blue team. Uh, and there's the Leo ban. I honestly want Blizzard to just finally implement a mode. And I don't know why this hasn't happened. It honestly tilts me to no end. I think, like, uh, really, th there's very little good things that you can say these days about Blizzard. One of the things that they could have done already years ago that would have made at least custom games and a lot of things so much more fun because you have a lot of potential is if they would allow you in custom games to pick the same hero multiple times for a team. Can you imagine how much, how much bullshit you could pull off with that? five Abathas against five Murkies or whatnot. It's like, it would be so amazing, but yeah, for some reason, they still don't allow that. Uh, we got Medivh in for Azerite, and yes, Medivh gets now taken <laughs> by the blue team. So they're apparently going to try to uh, give the Hardos a taste of their own medicine. They took a book out of their page, a uh, page of their book, <laughs> and have now the Leyline into Apocalypse set up for themselves with Malfurion as a possible follow-up. So good for them. And there's a Chen pick on the other hand. Chen and Falstead, a bit of portal control. They actually got quite a bit of portal control. Lucy with the boop is in. You can get Garrosh in there too. Copenhagen playing the panda. I mean, this is already good. This is already a good one. And they Quasar now for the final pick. What is he gonna get us? They still need a side laner. Yeah, but let's see what they're getting here. Uh... URL. That's a strong lineup. That's a really strong lineup. Game number four. It might be the last one. Depends on the Hardos. Can they bring it back and forth? Game number five. We're going to find out now. Team Wah against the Hardos. Prepare yourselves for battle. Well, my body is ready, so let's go. Team Wah with Dequaza on URL. Banana H on Malfurion Dino on Tychus. Azerite is this time the Medivh player, so also in this case we're going to keep an eye on the stacks. Zelia with Diablo. And on the other side of the map it is the Hados. With Copenhagen on Garrosh, uh, Chen, Bad Benny on Garrosh, Yazu on Lucio, Nick on Greymane, and Hazobst on Falstad. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm absolutely ready. Adjustments are made already with Dash as the level 1 talent. A little bit more of a mobility talent for him than uh, the grenade setup that we see so often. And there we go. Mid lane brawl. Now we're going to get an early kill. Yasuo's just zipping around. Yasuo on speed already. They try to go for the flip on Zelia, but the portal is there. It's up to Azerite right now. He's the one that needs to really start saving his allies, get some good shields out, make sure that those portals are ready every single time, and then later on in the game, the ley line into Apocalypse is, of course, to a big extent up to him. There aren't really that many interrupts against the Apocalypse, and that might be a bit of a problem, because in the earlier games, when the combo was attempted, one of the things that happened quite often was that Diablo just got stunned out or silenced whenever he needed to use the Apocalypse. And that's honestly plays that we've seen in the past already, when Zeratul and Diablo, for example, was a composition that was played a lot. 
it's always the follow-up that you're really focusing on. And if you get that stun connected, you're in a good spot. But there's not that much CC this time for the Hardos. Now, don't get me wrong. They got some. But it's going to be tricky for them to control Zelia and his ap Apocalypse timing whenever we're seeing the ley line get dropped here. Now, again, we're all, well, not even on level 10 yet, so we're a little bit ahead of ourselves, but still, that is definitely a concern for the mid-game. 20 stacks for Hazu, not bad. Uh, he, one and a half minutes into the game and he's already on 20 stacks. Not too shabby. Only three stacks for Medivh. And once again, it's just a full-on party in the mid lane. The only one missing is Chen. The panda is all alone at the bottom lane. Oh, Hazu gets attacked here very, very quickly. There's Copenhagen. Uh, pandas to the audience with his hero choice. Level 4 talents. A little bit faster. No surprises here. The eyes in the dark. And the static shield now in two. Okay, so. Who gets the first kill in this game? Camps are up. First one got taken and dealt with. Mercenary camp on the right side. The Bruiser camp has previously been taken. Blue team delays theirs. Uh, and they're actually trying to go for the kill against Dino. Okay. Dino gets away. Nick and Hazu were hoping to get the drop on him. Which didn't work out. By the way, Master Assassin again. So, Master Assassin is in play down at the bottom of the map. So, let's see what we're getting here. Because right now, Dequaza is already down to half HP. And if Bad Benny gets him, then... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Urel, she kind of faked the movement into the, uh, into the, the steam there. If she, if she follows through on that, she's likely dead. Talking about likely dead. As a right, <laughs> nearly down. Instead, they turn it on Hazu. And Bad Benny saves the birdie by flipping it over well done okay i like how both of the teams know exactly what's on the line here hey, believe me the blue team does not want to go to a fifth map they don't want to go to a five map against them instead we have bot side now de quasa again attacked and this is a problem he just jumped that's the worst time possible for him to use his cooldown here he's dead he has to be dead. That has to be a kill. Copenhagen jumps in, and I would say worth, but he has 14 gems himself, and the birdie is already down, and that's a double kill. That, <laughs> that is more than a bit unfortunate. Yasu, he takes some of the gems, so they end up ahead in gems. They end up ahead in gems, at least a bit. Now, that is an interesting development here. 20 gems turned in by Nick. They're still down at the bottom of the map. Two kills against one. But when it comes to the gem count, the Hardos pulled ahead. It was a really weird development. But as it stands, the additional gems make it worth it. And that's thanks to Yasu just zipping in with Lucio and taking them. Nick on then again. He might be dropped here. There's the portal. Ooh, ha, ha, ha. Wow. Why so clutch every single time? Much clutch, much wow. Now the grenade on level 7 for Tychus. Level 1, he wanted the mobility. Now it's a bit different. 38 stacks for Hazu. Went into the boomerang. If he keeps stacking like this, he could get some serious damage out. Blue Web Weavers are still touching ground first. So Team Wa is pulling slightly ahead on the objective. And that is going to be interesting, especially in uh, the top lane, where they're making a play now also for Nick, these portal engages. This is really the most the most terrifying thing about Medivh on the other side. It's not necessarily the ley line. It's really that portal setup that can come out of nowhere and you just get ganked when a second ago you thought you were 100% safe. So now level 10 is getting a little bit closer for the blue team. And they are crushing through that top wall. They are going through that wall like hot butter through cheese as they are coming in swinging with a full three-man setup. Full four-man. They're trying to go for Yasu. 60 gems and the portal. Oh, he escapes. Yasu with a great escape here. Okay. Oh, boy. Down at the bottom. Still another wall that gets obliterated. 46 stacks for Hazu, 17 for Medivh, by the way. Nearly level 10. And with level 10, you might be able to do a bit more damage. Maybe take some of these fountains down. That would be kind of neat. 
but I like what we have here. Another aggressive game. It's always the risk that you kind of run with a series like this. You know that both of the teams are just so careful that there's not really a whole lot happening that's full-on tactical, but completely different setup now. Both of the teams just not afraid to go for the aggression, make some plays, or at least attempt to do so. Already we have Zelia with the Apocalypse and Leyline potential, but we got the top keg plays for Chen. Chen went for the top keg. Yeah, this is some top shelf play that we're seeing there. You're not going bottom shelf with the panda. No, you're going for the top with him. So the keg play is in. He could go full keg W with this one. But once the ley line gets dropped, the panda is going to go for his move. Copenhagen. Uh, talking, by the way, about moves. They're making a move for Medivh. Mm, no. No. They're trying, but not that easily. So level 10 on both sides. Turn in. Available for the hardos. They could go for it. And yeah, the bottom fort is down. Siege Giants took it together with Urel. That's a big win. That's a really, really big win. Uh, Zelia gets attacked. There's a bit of a flip attempt. Hello, Benny. Hi, Benny. And he's still alive. What a gust. What a gust. Medivh is dead. The stacks are gone. Oh, yeah, baby. Hazobs, he knows how to screw up a Medivh player. He's been on the receiving end of those plays plenty of times in this series. Azurite played false set earlier. They're going for it again. They're going for Zelia. Hi, Zelia. Bye, Zelia. He's down. Stacks are gone. And they are pushing this further. De Quaza gets interrupted mid jump. He's low. But I don't think, well, they might be able to kill him. <laughs> Close call. But here comes the turn-in. Bad Benny with the turn-in. Everybody reset on the stacks. Haas is at 52 now. And where's the damage? 17,000 for him. 22,000 for Greymane. All right. The big bad wolf. And now the potential to push some structures down. Let's go, baby. Gems were, of course, lost too. But they got the turn-in previously. Duh. Mid lane, bot lane. We can start to make the play here. Banana Age. They want game five. They won game five. The Hados. Boys, they're going for it. Bottom pressure against Urel. Look at that wall. Look at those towers. Easily taken down. Leyline. Apoc. The stun. But Hazu with a defensive gust. Nobody could get close. Nobody can get close. When Hazu is in position, he is ruining your place six days to Sunday. Level 13, the early talent advantage for the boys in red. Uh, a bit of damage at the bottom, in the middle. Uh, they might, they can't take a fort down. Maybe in the mid lane, a bit more damage is definitely possible, but I don't think that they can destroy the structure completely. Here comes the next flip. Portal is ready, I suppose. Zelia engages against Hazu. Top keg once more. Zelia low, but he gets the portal and can escape. Oh, they are on the chase. Banana gets his ult out and receives the shield from Medivh and can survive to fight another day. Keeps the rest of the team alive too. Once again, the Zelia engage maybe a little bit too deep this time. 13 stacks for Azerite. Hey, quickly stacking it up again. Lost 17 earlier. It would be at 30 now if not for him being obliterated. And Hazel still getting more stacks in as the red team controls another turn in. So that's the second turn in in the row for them now. All right. They should at least get one fort out of this play. At least one. And still, 71 stacks for Hazu after 10 minutes? That's some solid work. That's really good work. Blue team, they have so much potential here with those combos. Leyline into Apoch, we've talked about it so many times now because it's not the first time that we're seeing it in the series. But who is making the plays now? Because that's an easy kill against Malfurion. Top keg play from the Panda. Copenhagen on fire. And now Team Wa is gonna get crushed. They, are, they have a big problem now. First the fort in the middle of the map goes down. Very likely they're gonna get more drop topside. And yeah, this is nasty. They're getting shit on. If this continues, then they have to take a shower after the game. Because they're gonna be dirty. That's another big hit. Mid lane, keep wall. <laughs> yeah, they're going through that too. There's the ley line in the Apoch and they screw it up. They screw it up. 
No. Oh, Dainu. Yeah, Dainu down. Azerite trying to rush away. Have fun attempting to escape from Yazu. Once again, he's dropped. Yes, Hazu died too, but the stacks on Medivh are gone. Six kills, two, three. The hardos go through team wah, like hot butter through cheese. They go into the mid lane for the keep, and they're going to get it. We're 11 and a half minutes into the game, and they are dropping the keep, everybody. The keep is down. Level 16 is ready. They are murdering the blue team. They want to go to game number five, and currently it seems like nobody can stop them from accomplishing that goal. The funny thing to me is that we still have a fort at the bottom of the map. I don't think this is going to survive much longer. Eventually, they're going to make a play for it, but still. Zero stacks on Medivh. And with the level 16 talent, they are trying for boss. Now, you got to be careful that you're not going to go into a throw pit here. You don't want to throw at boss when your opponent comes in with another ley line, but it's another 13 seconds until that's a thing. And nobody's moving in. They're letting this one slide. Yep. They are letting this one go. Medivh, he has the ley line. Yeah, <laughs> he's not going for it. <laughs> no ley line play by him. They're trying for the turn-in. They want the turn-in and it gets interrupted. Trading a turn-in for a boss is something that you see on this level all the time, but it gets denied. Here comes the follow-up though. Here's the Apoch. And then immediately we have the sound barrier from Lucio that saves them. Zelia then again. Yeah, you can't save him. Maybe with a good portal, but nope, it's not coming. He's down. He had the stacks. Top keep is about to fall. And Copenhagen, Fat Illidan, he could jump after them, but he doesn't. They got the turn in after all, but it doesn't really change the fate of the top keep. This one is not going to make it. Yeah, honestly, if they made a move for it, I think they could have maybe saved it. But it seems like it's going to fall, so they're trying to at least get damage in the middle of the map. Here comes the Quasa! And no. Just no. Another ley line. Oh, that's a kill. Yes, Yasu is down. That's a good start. Boss is at the core. Two keeps down. Of course, the blue team is trying to somehow turn it around now, but in order to make that work, they need a lot of damage done. And they get at least a kill. And that, of course, without a support, means that the Hardos are in a real awkward position. You don't want to poke this out if you don't have a support to help you out here. Another attack. Top gag plays as the Panda is coming in again. They're trying to go for Azerite. And <laughs> Medivh is dead again. Medivh is down and does not have any stacks. Yeah, unfortunate. They're still not giving up though. The red team is also eating a lot of damage here. And the problem is that at the bottom of the map, the web weavers are now going for the keep. So this is another problem that they're facing. Zelia is dying though. And this time he's down for the count. So they're starting to chase hard. They want to go for even more kills. Might even be trying to go for the core. Bottom keep is about to fall. Banana age. Nick. Oh, are they going for it? It seems like it. Top fort is also down. I mean, again, they get the kills. But guys... They're getting kills, but they're losing structures. And all of a sudden, did he just use... Yeah, he used his ult too. Lucio just used the ult. So now it's a much more even game than I initially expected. It's a level advantage thanks to all of the kills that the red team got though. So that's a bit different. Haas is at 95 stacks, by the way. 95. Damage output on the birdie is 38,000. The panda is at 37k. It's a bit of a weird one. Ah, it's a level 20 talent that is the biggest problem, I suppose. What's the boss timer? They just took it, so it's two minutes. Two minutes on the boss. Camp in the mid lane, of course. Oh, if they get some kills here. Can you imagine that if they somehow get the drop? But engaging into this fight, Urel has to pop her ult. They do not have Tychus here. They still got a bottom fort, so good for them, I guess. It's unbelievable to me that this thing is still standing. We're 15, 16 minutes into the game. They want the kill before the level 20 hits. Leyline, Apoch! Ah, but the gust. Hazu. Hazu with the gust. Hazu is that pillar in the defense of a team. He's always there when you need him. Reliable. Efficient. So reliable. So efficient. So German. Middle of the map. Another push for the core, but they are going for another kill. They're trying. 
And the disengaged tools are being used over and over again. The hardos with everything. They have the sound barrier. They got the top keg place. They're chasing. It's a big brawl. They fight against the level 20 talent, and I'm not quite sure why. Well, the turn in is there, I suppose. So they want to avoid running up against web weavers again. But it's going to be rough. Just continuously fighting here until level 20 hits for them is more than nasty. The shield, by the way, has not been dropped on the core completely. But they're going to drop Zelia now, aren't they? Oh, the ley line! And it's still a kill. It's still a kill. Ley line or no ley line? They weren't able to save Diablo. The Hardos, they won game five. There's the wind tunnel. Dino on the run. Is he gonna get out? I mean, he's gonna get out. Urel then again isn't, so that's both of the frontliners gone. Hazu flying in deep. Dino, he gets away. But this is still looking like it's gonna be the final nail in the coffin, right? Yeah, they go for Banana H. And he's dead. Banana is down, and so is Dino. Guys, we are going the full distance on this one. We are going to game number five. They make the play 14 to 4 kills, and this is it. We are going the full distance in this winner bracket final. It's awesome. The final map incoming, a final kill on Medivh, and then they seal the deal on Tomb of the Spider Queen. The Hardos tying the series against Team Wow. Sky Temple, map number five. Team wah, against the Hardos. I love this. The full distance. And it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Because given the performance of the blue team throughout the qualifiers, you would have expected this to be... I don't want to say one-sided. That's definitely not really true. But I expected the blue team to come in as the favorite. And right now... We are in a position where I could totally see the Hardos claim this one. If you think about what happened on uh, Towers of Doom... <laughs> if they would have decided... If they played Towers of Doom a little bit cleaner towards the end... They could now be in the Grand Final. And no matter how this ends... No matter which team drops into the lower bracket... There are still some heavy hitters in the lower bracket. The Donuts being one of them, of course. So this is just incredible. I, I love this. This is just so good. And Nubara gets banned. So does Junkrat and Lucio. And I mean, this being Sky Temple, there are a lot of shenanigans that you can go for here. Yeah, we know that. So... <laughs> what do we get? First pick, first ban by Team Wah. Which means that it was the hardest that decided in favor of Sky Temple. And we had Infernal Shrine still up. Brightwing gets taken first. You don't want your opponent to surprise you with some global picks. But talking about globals... Vikings? Abatha? Anything nasty? Not saying it's gonna happen. But I think there's a chance. I suppose now you are gonna see the bird very early though. With the Haka ban and Bright being taken, you wanna have some kind of global presence on the map. And the bird's the word when it comes to that. Greymane. Nick on Greymane. There seems to be a bit of a trend today. There's a couple of times now that Nick played Greymane and he is murdering people. Absolutely murdering. So, we got Stukov. Together with that. One of the most popular supports outside of, I guess, Lucio and Brightwing. Yasuo and Lucio. <laughs> Massive pain in the ass. As, he pro as proven on the last map. And there it is. The double global. The birdie is in. Yeah, well, the Hardos didn't go for Falstead. I don't really think that they gambled and thought they could take him later. With the Haka banned and Brightwing taken, it was pretty obvious that it would be tough to get Falstead if you don't take him in the early rotation. Zelia is falling back on his Mirrodin place now that Anubarak has been banned out by them because they didn't want him to be taken by the, the others. But, yeah. Tracer. Ban Tracer against Dainu. I, I'm kind of hyped. I'm still waiting for the potential X-Factor pick here. 
you know, something... I mean, it doesn't even have something to be too insane. If, for example, Nick decides that he picks Greyman, they switch... Uh, sorry, that he decides... He, deci well, he decides to pick uh, Kerrigan. They pick Greyman and someone else. There's the Abathur Bab. I totally understand this, because with Greyman as an early pick, and uh, this being a Sky Temple, you're really looking towards your opponent's setup, and you're like, what do they really think here? Why didn't they pick Inferno Shrines, for example, which is a much more common map to be taken? Why do they go for Sky Temple? What do they have? Do you go for Medivh? You want to have at least some control over the boss point. There are so many games on this map that end on the boss. And one team has Gust and a potential Emerald win. The other team has nothing. Now, Benny going for ETC provides him with a Mosh Pit. Likely. Could be a stage dive, but Mosh Pit is a bit more likely. And Urel. So you have at least some space that you can create on the boss point. But Abatha, that's a very good ban from uh, the blue team. I, li I like that ban a lot because Greyman with a symbiote and a double Greyman is super, super difficult to deal with. But Hazu hasn't picked. Zagara! There she is! Is Hazu going for the sergeant? Are they going to do that? They have ETC and Urel. They can both create a lot of space. If they go for the sergeant... We'll see. I mean, it's Azu. Vikings, hammer time. What's it gonna be? <laughs> but Zagara pick is also not too bad. After the patch. My F! My F, everybody! Zagara for the blue team. My F for the Hardos. Alright. Game 5. Final map in the winner bracket final. Which team moves on to the grand final? Which team drops down into the loser's bracket? We're going to find out right now on Sky Temple. I would the final map, everyone. It is map number five. Yep, the final map in this series. Do the Hardos have what it takes to take the blue team down? During the qualifiers, that question was solidly answered with a nope. But now, maybe they can. Maybe they can. They go up against the Quas on Blaze. They go up against a Dainu on Zagara. We have Azerite on Falstead. Brightwing, uh, played by Banana Age. Zelia on Muradin. And on the right side of the map, Hazops on Greyman. Bad Benny on ETC. We get Nick on Mayev. Copenhagen on Urel. And Yazu on Stukov. And already the fight for the vision has started. ETC with a slide. The follow up attempt. So far not successful and everybody is aggressive again. Going for the throat here. Not only Greyman, boy. Vision controlled for now by the Hardos. And Zelia hammering out the Storm Balls. Hobbity hop, little dwarf. He's gonna jump around again as much as he can. And the I mean, there are a couple of advantages for the blue team that we of course have already talked about, but we have to, we have to point that out again. Oh, hello, team. Oh, clutch. Yeah, if you have two globals on the map, you can really do a whole lot on Sky Temple. I mean, Sky Temple really hinges on your ability to do structural damage because the objective attacks structures directly. So if you are in a position where you take the structural lead, you can always trade evenly if you're with your opponent on the objective and you will eventually win the game, which is pretty big. And this is something that you have to keep in mind here, as Falstad has the ability to push out lanes and then join the team later on in a fight by simply flying in and using his global. With the Haka banned, there's not a lot of other options that were left. You have, of course, at least theoretically, the opportunity to use stage dive on ETC and therefore give yourself a pseudo global, which has been used in the past. I mean, there were days in HTC where, e where sorry, in HTC where ETC was picked as a first pick because of his ability to be flexible enough in these situations to adjust to the opponent's picks. Talking about being adjusting, yeah, that's Muradin down. So this time the aggression of Zelia definitely turned against him. Yeah, it's not only a camp, but a kill that they get. Still need to deal with the bot lane pressure, as we have false at end blaze here. Zagara, of course, is another thing that we have to watch out for. With the nerves that were pushed on her in the current patch, that dropped just before the... well, in the middle of the tournament, actually. With those changes, there's always the chance that teams just overestimate the abilities of a hero that was nerfed by them. We had that already earlier. I mean, Zagara, ever since all of that happened, wasn't even picked. 
or banned. So teams just decided that she's not really worth it anymore. With the Banelings nerfed a bit, her Q ability, and then the hit point pool, hit point regeneration, and also the damage getting slightly nerfed. It wasn't really a priority. But it's all over, also very early still in the new patch, so that's another thing. Copenhagen, ah, they go for the birdie. That's a kill. That's a kill. Even even with Brightwing moving in. That's a double. They get two kills out of this situation. Double kill for the Hardos. Guys, all of a sudden, we have a lead for the red team. Three kills to zero, and maybe now even the upper hand on the objective. Quick look at the double kill as we're heading into all of this. They followed it up, the birdie flying away, Bright being helping out, and then both of them are ending up being just put between a rock and a hard place. And that's two kills for the Hardos, in addition to the initial one that they got earlier. So now, it's all about how much you can control here. And they are trading bell towers. Uh, sorry, not bell <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's been a long day. It's been a long day. It's been a lot of casting. Yeah, it's, it's temples. They're not trading bell towers. That was map number two. No, we're going for temples here. So Nick with another tether attempt as he moves in with my F. And they are doing a lot here with our boy Stukov because he went also on level 7 into the growing infestation. So they get even more control. Brightwing is dead and Azerite nearly died too. That's 4 kills to 0 now. And I gotta say that the Hardos are really starting to establish a solid map presence that would maybe even allow them to take full control if they're able to steal a few more camps away if they maybe grab a couple of kills yeah like for example this one against Dainu Z no way no way <laughs> Zegara she's alive oh one auto attack was all that was needed there and they could then get it so four kills to zero but this ain't over nope we got down to the bot lane Nick still playing it out against the Quasar it's not even half level lead for the red team now, of course, initially, this looks really good for them. Having a bit of control is kind of nice. You're dominating the rotations on the map. You're the ones to really make the moves. And they are starting to pick up more and more kills here. It's actually incredible. At this point, you got to ask yourself if the blue team is a little bit sleepy here. They might need a coffee or two to wake up. What's going on? Camp at the bottom is maybe stolen, but they are getting counter pressure at the top. Yeah, the attempt to steal this one. It's a three versus two. I'm not quite sure if they really want to stick around. And with Brightwing now moving in two, they definitely don't. But the problem that I have with this is that it seems that Grey Main is going to easily take the top four apart now. And at the bottom of the map, this is still something that you can defend against. Now, of course, there's Siege Giants coming in from all sides. You've got to be careful with this. But the lead and the experience is there now. And it leads to an early level 10 for them for sure. And it's all about the bottom position now. Decent creep spread still on the map for uh, Zagara, so they need to control these creep tumors a little bit better. And Bad Benny is already working on that. Next temple is activating, another 28 seconds. Level 10 abilities on both sides bring us Avatar. And no surprises here. Maw is being used. We got the bullet for Greymane after the earlier go for the throw. That's probably worth pointing out. And there it is. Stage dive for ETC. So yes, they go for the pseudo global. They will set ETC up on the side lane. He's the one that has to deal with false dead. And that is now something where Bad Benny can fall down to the bot lane. But I like how Azerite and Zelia engage on the top so that they can take the fort down even before the objective is taken. Now, of course, that also means that at the bottom of the map, they have to give up the temple shots, at least for now. But it's still enough time for Zelia to rotate down and then force a fight with the rest of the team. And maybe even get control over the temple. Five kills to zero so far in the game. But the lead in structures goes to the blue team. They are ahead in structures. Experience? That's still a lead for... There it is. Stage dive. Can they go for Dainu? No. And another great gust. Azerite this time forces Hazorps away. Don't think that Brightwing can take the kill. But the fight down here, that's a different story. The disc is already out and it's stopped plays cold. They hope to follow up. But the bunker has been used already. So now, oh, that's a big shove. Holy shit, get the hell out of my team fight. That's what that meant. Greyman is now moving in as well. There's still a few shots left on the temple that they're trying to go for. And they're going for more than that. They want to go for Zelia. He's attempting to hop out and he's making it work. Banana H also takes a few more hits. Shots get fired. 
but it doesn't deny the fact that Team Wah is slightly ahead now in structures. It's actually not even true. They're only slightly ahead. I mean, they took the first fort. Yeah, that this didn't hit either. There's always the boss that you can eventually go for. If you look at the minimap, <laughs> not again. Zelia, no, the tether. Muradin gets farmed, and well, that opens the boss play up. That was a bit of a misplay. With Muradin dying, boss is up. Gust is there. Azerite might try to steal it, but this is going to get a bit clutch. Well, they got, they got more, and they got Gust. They got way more than I expected here. So, yeah. Oh, the jet propulsion missing. That's a dead. That, ah, well, he got the bunker. He might still be dead here, though. Yeah, the maw. He can't escape. He's stuck between the bunker and the maw. A rock in a hard place. And that's the end of place. Staggered death against place. That's seven kills to zero now. 16,000 damage for Greymane. Top, by the way, is pushed by a camp. Creep spread everywhere. Zigara has creep tumors all over the map now. They really need to control this. We're not on a level yet where Jadong would be jealous, but he is definitely channeling his inner Zerg player. They go for the cap again. Growing infestation. Zelia, not again. The gas to try and save their asses here. But another slide, and that's a problem for Muradin. Brightwing helps out once more. Mayev isn't here, of course. So that means a lot. That's honestly the only thing that kept them alive here. 13 to 13. This is such a weird one. Game number five, and it is super weird at this point. Because we got seven kills to zero, but the blue team is ahead in experience. They're controlling the map a little bit better. That's just all there's to it. Yeah, the discon... Oh, nice jump. Very nice Vault of the Wardens here by Nick. He got the disc out and was nearly forcing a fight, but not quite. Now, up at the top, Bad Benny. He's firing the shots against the fort. So far, so good. But the same is happening at the bottom of the map as the teams are exchanging shots with uh, control. Stormbolt, jet propulsion. Bye bye, Stukov. The Maw on ETC. He literally jumps into the Maw. That's one kill. That's two kills. And the bird is trying to go for a fly. Doesn't even have to go for a gust here. So that's three heroes down. And all of a sudden, the red team is falling farther and farther behind. Not only do they take the back seat when it comes to structures on the map. Nope, they're also falling farther behind now in experience since those kills mean a lot for the blue team. And another fort is about to fall. By the way, as the boss gets attacked, quick look. Look at the stage dive. Check the stage dive. Straight into the maw. Straight into the maw of Zagara. And now the boss, as you can see, is taken too. So they go for the boss. They lock it in. And that's, of course, just success on all objectives here. They got not only the full-on channel at the bottom temple, they are also in a position where they could take the boss. They are giving up some of the shots topside, I suppose, but I think not even that's going to... I mean, that shouldn't even be a problem. With them locking in level 16, the blue team cannot make a play for that. They got level 16. Follow-up attempt. They're going for the tether once again. Uh, but it's the birdie that's in trouble. As a right... He got ganked up. They want the chicken. They got chicken. So that's another kill. Eight kills to three. And they're still massively behind. But thanks to the shots fired, they're able to take another fort down. So good for them. Zelia, he's trying to disrupt them as much as he can. The problem is that Yasu is also in trouble. But here comes the stage dive. Dequaza. Great bunker timing for him. Oh my god. What a beautiful escape. Bunkers up just as, they, as the slide comes through. And now this. Keeps are taking damage. A few more shots have been taken. Top lane is opened up. Still no level 16. And they try... Oh, the double more. They try to go for the kills here. Ah, but there's not enough. My F, my F for the tether. Can they go for a kill? Hazu is dead. Greybane is down. And it seems like they might get another one against Bad Benny. ETC, he gets stunned by the jet propulsion. Bad news. Just as they hit level 16, the Hardos are losing heroes. Plenty of them. Three down. And that is just a disaster. Six kills to eight. And look at this massive gap in experience now. Two levels ahead. A two-level lead. Team Wah is moving for it. They go for the keep. 
I don't think they're really going for core here, even though they postured a bit. But they will make sure that they're taking a few more of the structures in the mid lane down. Keep in mind, as long as you're ahead in structures, you're always going to be in a good spot when you trade objectives. Another hit and a missed disc. Nick was trying to lock them down a little bit longer. See if they can maybe get someone killed on their way out. But the answer to that is... Nope. So, for now, we got 18 versus 16. Six kills to eight. A double temple coming up next. And they're just trying to control the map. They're trying to go for all of the camps now. They already locked in the siege shines at the bottom right of the opponent. At the bottom left, they have another chance to do it once more. Brightwing is already securing that. Playing this a bit slow. And this one is even going to be timed. Boss, two minutes. Yeah, another timing here. Bam. All of the camps get locked in just as the objective spawns. And that, of course, puts even more pressure on the Hardos as they have to control so many things at the same time and try to work around it. Yazu gets attacked by Zagara, who's the top damage in the game with the 35,000 she has. That's the nerfed version of Zagara, obviously, after the patch that dropped today. And here are the shots fired. Zelia's jumping in. He's going in deep. Keep that in mind, all of the lanes are getting pressured. Mad pressure on Zelia too, but here's the more. They're trying to go for the kill. The birdie is low. They're stun against Stukov. Azerite made it out, and instead we have the Stukov kill. He's eliminated. So is ETC. Urel is trying to escape. The Stormbolt hits Nick, and he dies. And up at the top lane, the camp is pushing this in. Greymane is on the run. Dainu, he wants to get the kills. And now the blue team is going straight towards the core. They are trying. Greymane is still being chased. Dainu is attempting to run him down. The top keep is falling. It's about to be... Well, Raymond is dead and it's about to end. That's the end of the game, everybody. With only Urel remaining and the core falling, this is it. It took them long and it was nearly a victory for the Hardos, but it is team wah, that locks in the 3-2 against the Hardos and move on to the grand final. The Hardos drop down into the loser's bracket.